Welcome to Dead Genre Chronicles, a critical podcast on the diversity of JRPGs. Drawing from the origin of the genre to the present day, every month we play through a JRPG and we invite you to play along and send us your questions and thoughts on it. I I added an S there. I'm going to leave that in. I'm Devin, and with me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, Becky and Leroy. Hi. Hi. (laughs) And it is always that intonation, 13 episodes later. (laughs) <laughs> it's our birthday. We got a new different one. <laughs> no, it's it's good. Hey. <laughs> What's that? <up? laughs> no. That's um, Jackson's intro <laughs> from Abnormal Mapping every month. Oh my god! Okay. You know what we should do, Leroy? Next next month we should swap <laughs> intonations. <laughs> yeah, you you can do the hey, and I'll do the hi. <laughs> um. Uh, okay, this episode, uh, we will eventually be talking about Nier, uh, which is an action RPG made by Kavia and directed by Yoko Taro, but before that, it's our anniversary episode, and I'd like to take some time to talk about the past year of podcasting we've had. One year ago, to this day, uh, a windstorm knocked out my power for two and a half <laughs> days, and we failed to record a podcast due to that. Um, yep. We, we had to postpone it. But we did eventually record uh, Live a Live School Idol Festival, <laughs> which was probably the worst episode title we've had. But it was also incredibly just, it was there. We had to. Yes. Um, uh, lots of our episode titles are, <laughs> it was there, we had to, one way or another. Uh, yeah. Um, especially Super Hexagon Kata. <laughs> Which yeah, I, I was can, pleased with that one. I can say, because I <laughs> every time I read it, I have to say it aloud, just because it's ridiculous. So I guess the first thing that we've learned I think in our all first these titles year of podcasting... Were mis- were, these were a mistake. I don't like any of the titles. <laughs> yeah. It's like they're dated instantly once they come out. It's like, oh no. <laughs> it's out of my mouth. This is the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I regret nothing. Well, I didn't name any of them. Yeah, none of them. Your, your, uh... <laughs> so you're innocent. Why are you complaining? Well, <laughs> he's still an accomplice. Um, but you were saying, uh, Becky? I was just uh, no. I was shit posting about how like titles are good or not good or anyway. Yeah. Let's actually talk about the the last year. Uh, what have we we uh, what have we been up to? Well, we. <laughs> We've had some difficulties discussing the genre is kind of difficult on its own because aside from like everyone can kind of well I guess even in Final Fantasy there's some discrepancies with popular opinion um as the staunch defender of Final Fantasy 13 <laughs> will tell you <laughs> um yep but basically everyone kind of gets that Final Fantasy is the most accessible and popular JRPG, but past that, it really kind of just shatters into a bunch of different JRPG canons, so it's been difficult picking, like, important games, because everyone will think that their game is more important, because it is to them, but there's no, like, single continuity, it's just, like, a bunch of legs propping up Final Fantasy. Um, uh, (laughs) so, we have... I'll, I'll pull up the schedule for the last year um, and further on, because the next year is also going to be interesting. Um, so we started with Live Alive, which is, like, it was a kind of good starter, because it's an SNES game, which is, like, a lot of people will call, like, the golden or, or silver era of JRPGs. And, uh, but it wasn't Chrono Trigger. It was Square, but it was interesting. It's like a name people knew, but, like, didn't know what it was about, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd never heard of it before it was suggested for this, but it was kind of... Once I kind of went to Wikipedia and read about it, it was instantly the most interesting thing I'd heard from the SNES era. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it was very much trying to experiment uh, 
I think uh, it's been a while since I've listened to that podcast a year, but I think RPG Maker comparisons were made just because that's the sort of experimentation that it was going for in the SNES era, which was interesting to play through, uh, especially when basically people largely remember Square and SNES for Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of counterpoint to these games that were really kind of expanding and pushing what the, the hardware could do in terms of scale. And then you have this game that's just these little vignettes, and they are very like RPG Maker games, which tend to be smaller in scope and more stylistically unified, I guess. And the the different chapters of Live Alive, each one of them was in its own way very, very tight. It, it was very punchy, kind of like yes. it, it did its thing and then it pulled back and it was done. Yeah, and there were so many great ideas in there that I wish more, like, I wish more games had had gone with. You know, the the blah, 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 the alien chapter, the bally robot chapter. Cube. Um, <laughs> Cube. That's his Cube name. Because I, I can only remember the the ridiculous name that that I gave him. Sorry, um, but yeah, that that chapter that had basically no combat in, and the cavemen chapter where the random encounters were because like you were si- it was simulating a plane and like vast distances but you could make the random encounter markers appear by sniffing the wind it's just really interesting variations on what the mainstream jrpg was at the time that i wish we'd seen more development of but then like chrono trigger came out and wiped everything away I think. Well, I don't want to stand too much for Square stuff, but they've had a, like they have their saga games too. They've had a history of experimentation that just they just never thought was That's appropriate true. for the for never thought was appropriate for the West, and so. Well, I I guess yes, it, it's fair to say that actually some of, some of that perception that there's no experimentation is 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 selected for by what we what we get as a, a market and what we got in that period where we were not perceived as a big market for this kind of games. Yeah. And so, were they even wrong? They're, I don't think they're that wrong. And uh, at that time, especially Western consumers, probably weren't very responsive to <laughs> stuff they could well, just pick up and understand. I mean, these days, we're not the the market isn't very responsive. It, it <laughs> it's uh, the only response seems to be scorn or yeah. contempt, possibly. Yeah, um, either way, temperamental. And yeah, yeah it was. I do want to say that we've only been doing this for a year, and with the games we've picked, we did double up on, like, Kingdom Hearts. We did Kingdom Hearts and Kingdom Hearts 2. So it's not like we have all the series or, like, all the data points on our resume so far. So we are going to, yeah, like, but... we are, like, working from a limited uh, experience right now, and we will be working through some more stuff in the coming year and years. Yeah, but also, like, we can't be expected to have played literally every 40-hour JRPG ever made <laughs> before we have any opinions on them. Yeah. I mean, um, imagine the amount of podcasts that have already done Final Fantasy VII. There's, like... Ugh. Uh, <laughs> and six. Uh, yeah, and six. So, like, they're good picks. Yeah. yeah. Just talking about games that don't get talked about that much. And uh, speaking of, of uh, games that don't quite get talked about as much... We followed that up with, uh, it was uh, a straw poll between Grandia, Suikoden, and Wild Arms, and we ended up going with Wild Arms. And the first Wild Arms game is not very good. And I, <laughs> That's I d- fair to say. I don't think any of us had, like, a good time with it. Um, nope. But it looked good at times. But... Yeah, it, but it was also very much like, this is a, a very early... PS1 game that felt more like an expansion to an SNES game. Yeah. And uh, without any of the like learning moments that it that would have happened on having developed an SNES game. Yeah. You could tell they'd thrown some ideas at the wall, but like even where they'd stuck a little bit, they hadn't done anything with that. Like the random Zelda bits, the tools and stuff. Um but you two in 
enjoyed it enough or interested enough to play Wild Arms 2, which has been an ongoing saga for the entire year since. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you still haven't done that mini episode on I it. We actually we haven't. <laughs> it's like, actually, I've, still, I've never finished the game. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> I say, I'm saved right in front of the final dungeon and I'm just like, I haven't come back. Yeah, but Wild Arms 2 has like a lot more character than the first one, at least. And I... Also, it's all <laughs> it's really easy. Like ah. it's really easy. Like it was balanced for not having a bunch of like personal buffs that made you stronger and resistant to like status effects and made you heal health when you got more force points and force points actually do a thing instead of just being a faux timer for status effects and it's like, "Ooh, this is <laughs> this is what the first one needed to be for it to be like mm. interesting." Other like well, it's like the personality in Wild Arms Two is palpable when you turn it on because, like you can you can feel that they're trying to break ground and do new things. Like Wild Arms One is like an like an artist like just getting started and they're still applying their influences like like readily liberally like they just wanted to make the kind of things they like really bad and that comes off. And then Wild Arms Two is like actually we can do our own thing. We have something in mind and it's like really confident and you feel it immediately like whoa. And that was it's actually really good. Yeah, it's really refreshing. I was worried after the first one that I was going to burn out on Wild Arms 2, but, like, no. It's really, like, surprisingly easy to just sink, like, four or five hours into. Because you're just like, oh, I can do all these things and get lost in the world map and then find all this cool stuff. And <laughs> it's, it's just really cool. And I'm sad that, yeah, Wild Arms 1 is bland, unfortunately. It's just kind of like... What if we made Dragon Quest, but kind of a Western? It's a weird yeah. Western. <laughs> and that's... Just yeah, I kind it. of... I think I'm glad that we played it, because it gave some context to that PS1 era that we've spent... Like, obviously is really important historically for the genre, but also we spent quite a lot of time on this year. Um, and understanding that that was where, the, where people were in terms of... Where, where Japanese devs were in terms of understanding the genre at that time does help contextualize what happened after that with like obviously FF7 and the huge boom in games production that that provoked. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was Wild Arms. And then we moved on to Kingdom Hearts, the first one. Uh, Leroy said yeah. I won on Kingdom Hearts. And we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, replaying Kingdom Hearts... Uh, was interesting and having two pairs of fresh eyes on it, Jackson and uh, Becky, was interesting because usually it's the year 2015 at this point, 2016 now, and usually if you're going to play Kingdom Hearts, you'd have played it in the f 14 years difference. Yeah. But, I mean, Becky hasn't played a Pokemon pl game either. <laughs> yeah. hence, uh, I had to play a tiny Patreon. bit of Kingdom Hearts before that, but. So yeah, like Kingdom Hearts was an interesting one because Jackson and I both really struggled to actually complete the game. But I found that bits of it and, and also of Rechain of Memories, which I played afterwards, have really stuck with me. Like in the works at the moment, I have a big piece, uh, which you've read, but which hasn't been published yet, kind of built with with Kingdom Hearts as its central example. And I think... There's a lot more to Kingdom Hearts than I guess I recognised at the time. Yeah, you know, I think in some ways I'm not happy with with my engagement with that game as as at the time of the episode. But also, it was a rough experience to play. Yeah, the first Kingdom Hearts is definitely it was rough, and also apparently the 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 final mix version that got ported to HD and made readily available is extra tough. Um, it, it does have some tweaks that make things more difficult, and I, I think uh, our friend Sam how it also complained about that, having played the uh, the HD port the for the first time recently, and yeah. mainly being on the first, like the original version. So it, the I really wish they didn't make it so hard because like even I, I think uh, when I first got it on PS3, I played it w through with a staff because I felt like it but that is just like completely untenable so it's just yeah. like mm, 
Well, I, it was kind of rough to introduce beginners to because, like, I didn't realize, like, how much more difficult it actually was on the port that's most readily available now, which is kind of disappointing. Um, mm-hmm. It was definitely, like, more accessible to, like, actual, like, young teens and kids on the PS2 with its difficulty, yeah. so... But also, I think, like, after you get past the Disney and Final Fantasy crossover fanfic level of understanding of that game, the next thing that you encounter is this idea that there's some really hardcore stuff in there, like the Sephiroth fight has always been... There's always been a, a kind of myth about that fight and how hard it is. So I guess some of the tweaks that happened probably are because of that, because they were expecting it to go to people who were not playing it for the first time and who knew it as this secretly super challenging thing. Yeah. It is still like amazing to watch um a speedrun of this game on proud mode in HD because there's yep. there's a thing that happens with the XP 0 like skill that you only get on proud mode that you can equip. It tweaks the damage scaling and also breaks like a, a, a like a trigger for or something for like finisher multiple er, finishers do a lot more damage, and if you do an air finisher I think and then use magic, all of that magic gets the the finisher multiplier, and there's a there's a summon you can use that uses the magic like set of rules, and just rapid fires fireballs. So, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, I've Mushu, seen that. Mushu can annihilate things, and it's just like that's incredible, but also incredibly broken, and yep. it's just and like, incredibly difficult to execute. Not really. So, you just have to be really? on, uh, like you just have on to, mode. yeah, and you put exp zero on, which means you like lose experience for that fight, whatever. But then, like, you do an aerial finisher, and I think it's just like uh, do magic. I was like, until you use another finisher, or like, until you swing again, you get all that bonus on your magic. So it's just like, okay, that's silly. Um, but while while we're talking about Kingdom Hearts, I'm gonna jump ahead a bit to April, uh, which is when we played Kingdom Hearts two, and Leroy was actually here for that because he hadn't played Kingdom Hearts two, which is a little weird, but not as weird as like, eh. Kingdom Hearts 2 kind of changed how Becky related to the series, I think. Yeah. <laughs> After playing Kingdom Hearts 2, I learned I like Kingdom Hearts 1. <laughs> I actually kind of went the same way, you know? Like, <laughs> I I prefer KH1 and Rechain of Memories to KH2 and Birth by Sleep, which I know is wrong, but also, mechanics aside, I found the earlier games more interesting, and... The stuff, the all the lore stuff that gets added in KH two lost me a bit. It turns into the Star Wars extended universe, but I don't. I honestly, <laughs> I honestly like the lore stuff. I like Nomura just having a field day with whatever <laughs> random crap. I he goes cannot up with. wait for Kingdom Hearts three to just explode <laughs> with lore. I mean, what's, what's the next version of Heartless going to be? What? How how are we going to have another metaphor for like shadowy beings that are the lost emotions of humans or that have had their souls removed or whatever the hell it is? I, I uh, mean, we already had in Birth by Sleep, there's Unverse, which are all the negative emotions of one person spread across the universe. Um, yep. And in, uh, uh, and in Dream Drop Distance, they're, uh, they're just bad dreams, so... Wait, Dream Drop Distance has another different kind of heartless. You're in dreams. They're dream eaters. <laughs> uh, They're nightmares. <laughs> like, you get them on your team. Those are the monster Some- types. Somebody needs to stop Tetsuya Nomura. <laughs> no. Just so leave t- him on Take the candy, he, take the candy he away get, from him because he he's get like some a money 12 in his year own old. studio. <laughs> uh. Yes, we need Tetsuya Nomura to go full Hideo Kojima. <laughs> I would, I would pay for whatever I came see, out of that. I want to see Nomura's name on Game Box as just like Tetsuya Nomura Project, and then yeah. it's just like. <laughs> actually, I don't I, even know what his games are like. It's like Xenogear- <laughs> It's like Xenogears in 2016. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. There was we a, have there not was hit Xenogears thing- yet. <laughs> there was a think piece like 
I guess sometime in 2015, um, about uh, basically about Nomura being taken off FF- FF15 and kind of shunted into just pure KH3. Yeah. And um, it, it was titled "The Air the Era of Japan's Great Video Game Auteurs Is Over." <laughs> and it literally was like oh my God. Nomura is the last Kojima. <laughs> the last Kojima is my favorite JRPG. <laughs> I would play the last Kojima. I would play the heck out of that game. <laughs> I would too. Oh my God. Okay. Well, let's, well, let's get back on track. Um, after Kingdom Hearts one. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I, oh, we're just on Kingdom Hearts two. Yeah, ish. Because I still I want to do my hot take. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I, f- I felt like Kingdom Hearts 2 is just a more homogenous idea of what an action game already was and uh, what they were already trying to do in the market. And compared to Kingdom Hearts 1's, like, unsurety and its own identity, uh, I just didn't find it as interesting. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um, back to you, Kingdom Hearts 1 times. Uh, after that, we played Resonance of Fate. Well, you two did. I, <laughs> I, I quit you after 20 out. hours. Yeah, the only time I've ever like actually quit a game, it was like a third of the way into the Resonance of Fate, and I was just yeah. like, In you fairness, know what? No. Resonance, <laughs> Resonance of Fate is the longest game we've done for the podcast so far, and turned out to be the longest episode of the podcast we've done. Fucking three um, hours? Oh my god. Yep. We are what sorry was, to make you What was you even that. in the three hours? Austin? We actually... <laughs> I mean, we, talk, we talked about a lot of stuff with yeah, that game. Yeah, we did talk about, about a lot of stuff. visual design, about kind of the actual kind of cinematic ambitions of the systems and the conflict that underlay them. It was the first time I talked really about the Travel Notes stuff that I've been doing because that's a... Um, a a game Travel Notes my, era... D- it, it's a travel notes game, and it's a 2006 to nine JRPG, and it's very symptomatic of that. Um, I remember I talked about miracles a bunch, and we did we you spent just a say long ti- <laughs> did you say 2069 or was that just like <laughs> 2006 to nine? Nice, oh, okay. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we I mean, mostly we spent a lot of time arguing about the ending and exactly which being in the universe was God. I think, <laughs> yeah. Um, because that is a game that's really confused about all was, JRPGs have to end with killing God. Yeah. That was a good podcast. I enjoyed that one. I think my hypothesis was like, oh, the god is Zenith, and it's the god of stasis, and they froze like the world in what they thought was the, the highest point of humanity, and it turned out everyone kind of fucking hates it. <laughs> but <laughs> that... Yeah. yeah like, I, I mainly experienced that game through Becky's stream, and... That the fucking last dungeon. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I really wish that gun system, like the gun modification system, was in a game that I could tolerate. Because I just yeah. If you've ever googled the fucking the best guns you can make in Resonance of Fate, oh boy, <laughs> those are like, amazing. They have like seventy billion barrels. It's great. I wish they represented that. Oh, they have that barrels movement. at right angles to one another. <laughs> yeah, it's just like that's not how guns work, <laughs> you guys. Like they have, they just have this single barrel just curving across the 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 workbench field, and it's just like, okay, got bullets don't come out of that. God, Resident really... Fate is like it's like a fever dream. I still like it a lot. Me too. Yeah, and I I, I still get like vague urges to go back and play it, but then I realize that I have better shit to do. Yeah, it's a, it's a great game for generating those urges, but it's impossible to imagine it ever satisfying them because to even get to any of the bits you're thinking about when you get an urge to play it, you have to sit through 20 minutes of bullshit. It's full of 20 minute sections of bullshit that you have to do before you can do anything fun. It's only it's only painful for 70 hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <don't>, okay. <sighs> don't worry, there's an EX dungeon that's only available on New Game Plus. <laughs> Yeah, no. Don't. Just don't. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> no, it was our, view, our listeners, please don't. Just don't. Resonance yeah. of Fate. Uh, that is my advice. Um, after Resonance of Fate was Trails in the Sky FC. Uh, this was a game which I, I suggested because I liked, and it's kind of like heralding the Trails series coming back into focus 
it, with like all the X seed stuff about like uh how localization of games that are like millions of characters of text is absurd. And uh mm-hmm. Well, yeah, also, also, was... also how uh, Japan has different canons and franchises that, that that do well over there and are successful there, and like are only now or still aren't even breaking over in the West. Yeah, yeah. Um, Trails, I mean, this was like Tra- Trails is doing well enough to continue getting localized. Like Cold Steel Two is coming out um, in a couple of weeks, I think, and the se- second chapter I think is what prompted. Uh, FC to get put on our schedule. Yeah, and like second chapter, I think was got quite quite a lot of notice one way or another for a game of its its size and its kind of tech level. Um, it is very two thousand six like PC game. Yeah, but like also there was a fucking Kotaku article on it <laughs> that <laughs> that we're still mad about nine months later. Yeah, I actually don't remember it. Thankfully. I, I just remember I remember opening up the Trails in the Sky FC episode. I I sure thought about it. I might not have actually done it, but like there was an excerpt that was like Trails in the Sky FC is the best JRPG of this decade and it was like this came out eleven years ago, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean that does whatever else we want to say about Trails, and you know I didn't like it at all, that does epitomize the state of Western people talking about JRPGs, um, so it, much. Uh, and and Leroy's right that you know this series that is a you know, fairly big deal in Japan, no traction in the West at all. It's all been created basically from nothing in the last two years. The the Western presence of this franchise, yeah, it stretches back into the nineties for crying out loud. Yeah, like um. I think one time when I was raising money for my Wii U and Xenoblade Chronicles X, I I was made to play uh, an old Legend of Heroes game on the NES, which we did get. But that is the the precursor series to uh, Trails or no? Oh, the Dragons. You're talking about the Dragon Slayer game. Right? Dragon Slayer, yeah. Because like, oh man, the uh, there were was a line of games called the Dragon Slayer games, and then, like, the sixth one or something was The Legend of Heroes. It's like a Dragon Slayer spinoff. <laughs> yeah, it's a spinoff, and it turned into the Trails games, and it's like, wow, that's... Or the Legend of Heroes then led to Trails as, like, a sub-series or something. Mm. And it's like... Proper Shin Megami Tensei territory. <laughs> yeah, but, like, Pretty they've much. been going for three decades, and... The ones that are getting traction now, um, the it came out in 2004, Trails in the Sky FC did, and then SC came out in um, 2006. We got FC on the PSP with kind of like a shitty translation. It wasn't the greatest like version to get, but we got it in 2011. Um, I think. I think. I think. A random order of the other games came out before that on PSP. Right? Yeah, there there were like three games that came out in English, but all the localization is terrible, and so, they weren't even they weren't numbered correctly either because it's just nope, like these were the first games. <laughs> yeah, it's just like oh god, but yeah, um, the whole trait of the Trails games that people are aware of is that there's a shitload of text, and localizing it properly. Hasn't really happened till 2014, when which is when Trails in the Sky FC came out. In 2015, <laughs> I think like the last week of October uh, was just like Trails in the Sky FC SC is coming out in two days, and people are just like, "What the fuck? <laughs> you can't do that to us!" <laughs> and it's just like, okay. Uh, but now, uh, Cold Steel Trails of Cold Steel is um, out on PS3. Um, it's actually 20 bucks right now, um, which I'm going to try and see if I can pick up, because it's normally 40 But um, And Cold Steel 2 is coming out soon. So, like, X-Seed has that foot in the door, but, yeah. but it's still not a, like, a Tales level or Final Fantasy level game, so they're kind of getting marginal returns on it, which is unfortunate. It's, pro- it's probably going to save the JRPG after Persona 5 kills it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god 
I can't wait for that <laughs> I, new I, WRPG. Honest, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, <laughs> but Final Fantasy 15 is the one that's gonna kill it. No, it's gonna bring no, it JRPGs back. <laughs> As Western RPGs. <laughs> wait, wait. So how is how is Persona Five going to kill the RPGs? But Fifteen is going to save them. No, if Fifteen is not going to save them. Fifteen is just going to happen, and like <laughs> nobody's going to talk about it at all. <laughs> then Persona Five is going to come out, me. and ev- everybody's going to be gaga over it until they realize that Persona games play like ass and are gross <laughs> and always have been. And the only reason Persona Four succeeded at all is because it sounds like a Joss Whedon TV show. And then, like, there's no way that Five is going to sound like a Joss Whedon TV show because it's got better facial animations. So the voice acting will have to match lip flaps. So we'll all be terrible, and it will not be anything like a snappy. And then the American weebs will go. I've, I have been mulling over this possibility in my head for this, months. Right? This, this, fan, this like fan fiction of the Persona Five release. I very enjoyed it. <laughs> Becky is a, a known hater of, of voices in video games, so pretty much. Uh, I mean, like, just make every game like the Zelda games. I don't want to hear talking when I'm gaming. There is literally like, a voice volume chirping. option in most video games nowadays. Like, I I could play Atelier Atelier Totori. Just I do have to turn the voices off because both voice tracks are bad, and <laughs> also the game is bad. Well, my bad take. I think Persona 3's dub's good. It is. Persona 4 dub, though. Ooh, no. <laughs> Let's not get into that one. I gather there are some landmines. I found out recently that Ashley Birch voices Risei in Dancing All Night and Dancing All Night only. Which is weird, because I know her for fucking Tiny Tina and also the comedy show she did with her brother. <laughs> God. Those those characters get recasted all the time. They're gonna have. They're just gonna like always <laughs> exist, but with different voice actors. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, let's move on. Let's. Uh, oh, <laughs> immediately after Trails in the Sky, Chrono Cross. <laughs> yep, which is incredibly pretty and completely garbled nonsense for much of its length. I know you you really liked it, Leroy. <laughs> or it really <laughs> kind of stuck with you. Chrono Cross is still my favorite. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't even really, I can't like justify myself that much. It's just like it's very surreal, very confused, very. It's a, it's a, it's a, like a, it's a bad AAA video game, but that's why I'm like enamored by it. I mean, it has a couple of the greatest like screenshot moments ever in video game history. Just in terms of holy shit, that's a thing that computer game visuals can do. Why don't more games do this? And it, well, um, it has it has like it has like a palette sense that I haven't really. It's like its own interpretation of that Square Enix style, but it looks more like it's more like pastels. It's more like like relief painting. It's like yeah, it, it's like it's very immediate. It it feels it feel it feels like it's drawing from like influences of knowing about art because Masato Kato is like he's not a real art nerd, but he's like I know the important artist art nerd. Yeah. And but but that shows and it actually you know it's just it's actually really good in Chrono Cross, yeah it's visually and I'm mostly visual when I play video games visually Chrono Cross is stupendous probably the best on the PlayStation. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I can't think of anything better certainly. Yeah, uh, it certainly uh, it sticks with you. I didn't really like it, and but there were moments that I j- either <laughs> were so absurd that they stuck with me. Or so stupid that they stuck with me, but always there. It looked nice when it was being dumb as shit. Mm. Uh, it's a very, it's a very good game for forming memories of. I think. Yeah. There, like I, I can still picture a lot of that game. It's just, it's just, it is honestly, it's weird, and there's like a lack of urgency with most things you do until, like, you turn into links or you're at the end of the game, and all of a sudden here's the entire plot, and it's like, oh. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it just tells you all the ways it's supposed to link to Chrono Trigger, and you're like. I, I played Chrono Trigger six years ago. I can't remember any of this shit. It doesn't make any sense. <sighs> Which is precisely the, the time gap that would happen if you played Chrono Cross when it came out and played Chrono Trigger when it was, it was relevant. So, like, ugh. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, I still remember moments like, uh, welcome back, Chrono Trigger. <laughs> just like, <laughs> that, that or not that moment. <laughs> I remember that. I mean, I everyone just like, remembers that one, so but... Dumb. That's uh, like oh, 
It fucking just fucking what's his face. So that's why they named the game Chrono Trigger seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Chrono Trigger, it's back, baby. Um, but yeah, also like the it's the, good again, Wolf Hell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, nah, it's fine. I mean, whatever. Ooh. I wasn't fast enough to think of uh, an appropriate meme. Yeah. Um, but, like, I still remember the moment where you're just, like, fighting your dad's friend in on the yeah, that's on the island in the sunset, and just, like, he has a lightsaber, but also he's just some fucking farmer dude. And it's just, like, time is frozen, it's sunset, fight this man. That's, like, that's like, Chrono, like one of Chrono Cross's best paintings, like, one of the best screenshots is, like, that place. Yeah. yeah. Um, so after, uh, divisive as hell Chrono Cross, uh, quote unquote, divi- I, I kind of want to mention how Chrono Cross, like we got a lot of questions about Chrono Cross because it's Chrono Cross and a lot of people were like, this, this game doesn't get enough respect when in reality it got like a shit ton of critical, like really good scores from like all the outlets ever. Mm. I think it's, like it's, me- it's, it's it's one of the few times where I'd actually admit the the mad fan base is right. It was a very poor sequel to Chrono Trigger, but it, like it was it was like it was kind of like ashamed of Chrono Trigger. Like didn't care about Chrono Trigger, but it was like contractually obligated to respond to Chrono Trigger still. Yeah, um, mm. I was just remembering like why don't one of our questions I think was something along the lines of why don't you think Chrono Cross gets the respect it deserves and it's just like eh, it did just like well, there's, people, people I think the present tense there is, is revealing because the, the meme about the game has become it was a disapp- disappointing sequel to Chrono Trigger yeah and like if you went to it looking for a sequel to Chrono Trigger you would be disappointed because it doesn't care about being that at all yeah um, but it's it's a game that's not allowed to stand on its own two feet which is, and which is most JRPGs. Yeah. It's, it's also it's also like the classic conflict of uh, just commercialization versus art in video games. It's like yeah. Chrono Cross wanted to be a more postmodern surreal work off the like off of what other Japanese media was doing, but it also had to be the sequel to Chrono Trigger because Masato Kato couldn't get on board for anything else, you know. <laughs> yeah, and like people. To this day, people are still like, oh, I wish they would have made a third Chrono game. It would have been way better than Chrono Cross and gone back to Chrono Trigger. And I'm like, no, dude, you do not understand what you're talking about. Chrono Cross is a game they wanted to make without the Chrono, like, attachment. But you force them into that by being such a huge fucking nerd. So... <laughs> Except Chrono Cross. I mean, on one on one hand, uh, Kato did actually make the game without the Chrono part. He made Radical Dreamers, yeah, and that happened. But I haven't played that, so like he, he did get to do that. But then it also became Chrono Cross. Yep. And uh, after now that we've contextualized uh, Chrono Cross as divisive, quote unquote, <laughs> it it wasn't for us. Um, Paper Mario: The Thousand Year Door. Oh, it I thought good. it was Xenogears next. Nope. That was pleasant. Nope. I was like, hey, that's a good game. <laughs> that's uh, Xenogears. Yeah. Nope. Um, Thousand Year Door first. Th- Paper Which... Mario, the Thousand Year Door. We all agree it's a good game. And End of thought. <laughs> like, it, yeah, I mean... <laughs> it's a we, surprisingly we solid interest- game. Yeah. The thing... Um, the, the, like, actually... Sorry. I'd say... Oh, I was just going to say about Paper Mario, it's like... If you know someone who's who's, like, interested in video games, but they don't really... They don't really, like... Like like the mainstream, the way video games are presented, or they look, or uh, like, or they you know they're not very good at video games because video games are hard to play. Uh, Paper Mario is Thousand Year Door, especially not the first one, is like such an amazing, perfect entry point for anyone of all ages. Mm. Yeah, it it can be kind of ruthless at times, but also it has a decent learning curve and it doesn't lean too much on any one aspect. So like. If you wanted to min-max the shit out of your character, you would just get all the badge points first, because you can equip badges that give you more HP or FP. But also, you can basically get as whatever combo of like level-up bonuses you want, and you're still probably alright if you're comfortable picking what you pick. So, it's it's really open to like different playstyles. Yeah. And it rewards you for It's a good game. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a good. It's game. a shame. It's actually quite difficult to get a hold of at the moment. Oh, it's such a pain in the ass. I think. Yeah. At, at one point, people were hoping for like a Wii U Virtual Console release, and that would be really good. Wouldn't but it just? I the only way the only reason I could play it was because my Wii is modded, and I could put it on there. So. Uh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and here's the doozy. <laughs> We've made it to Xeno Gears. <laughs> don't don't play Xeno Gears. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, I, Wait. I w- <laughs> that's but it's Xeno Gears. Xeno Gears is the greatest JRPG. It's the only. It's like the reason video games are art. Leroy. <laughs> don't play Xeno Gears. Video Let's games, move on. Video games didn't grow up until Xeno Gears came out. <laughs> until Choo Choo died for our sins. <laughs> Oh, that game is such bullshit. Xenogreas is a light novel, don't play it. It's a really heavy light novel. Fuck yeah, hell. it's I mean like, it's like it's like the entire twenty light novel series. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, basically I it's basically that fucking Mahoka show, but like a sixty hour video game and like oh it's like, it it's like, like even, trying even, to read the it, entire it, Bleach manga. It includes like the nasty light like, novel author politics too, where they're like misogynistic and ignorant and self-important. It has all of that. It's all together. It's a light novel. And even better, most of the second disc is a novel. <laughs> so, and a badly written one. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think we're done now. The yeah. only thing that you know, Gears like actually gave to us was Becky giving a lecture... And that was like the high point of the podcast for like intellectual pursuits. Um, oh, it was a it was a good podcast. It's just a bad yeah, game. It's such yeah. a bad game. Do not play Xeno Gears. And I know that if you're hearing this and you're a fan of Xeno Gears, you're not listening to this anymore. But <laughs> please understand that all three of us played this game to completion, and we all agreed <laughs> that we should not ask other people. To inflict it on themselves in order to listen to our podcast. Because we know that if we did, no one would listen to the episode. Because they would give up halfway through the game. That game is bad. Please don't play it. <laughs> so, we've done Kingdom Hearts 2 already. Yep. And uh, Next it was FF Final, Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics, <laughs> a.k.a. the only good Final Fantasy game. That's what <laughs> everyone that. says about everything. <laughs> like Which... <laughs> oh. I mean, the thing to say with every, every Final Fantasy game is the only good Final Fantasy game. Yeah, that's the, that's what I get. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I th- I believe that of at least two Final Fantasy games, even though it can't be true of two Final Fantasy games, but it is of <laughs> FF12 and FF13. But I and mean, the thing to say with F- FF Tactics is that kind of with Chrono Cross and Xenogears, it forms this parallel trilogy to FF789 of like there's the massive commercial banner success. PS1 JRPGs, and then there's this trio of weirdo games that are that have the cult status, and you know, FF Tactics, they're very different games, all three of them. FF Tactics and Chrono Cross are both light years ahead of Xenogears. I think for me FF Tactics worked slightly better than Chrono Cross, but uh, it's not anything like as nice to look at, and um... It, it's also the just ending doesn't garbage for plot. Like, w- once chapter yeah, they... one finishes, it's just like okay, let's ignore all the interesting stuff. It's a war. That's it. Um, mm-hmm. and then it is resolved with the death quote unquote question mark of the main character. Like, <laughs> he's not dead. Yeah, that writing team did not have the conviction to actually leave him dead. Yeah. We've we've also I I think a lot of our I, I that game irked me on a mechanical level and I I was the one who went straight for like the most bullshit class in the game that game is not like it you can get catharsis out of the grind but also you could do that in games with better systems and less mm. actual grind like there's so much grind. And yep. people don't really talk about that, but also, like, it's it's funny to watch a speedrun of Final Fantasy Tactics, the original, because they just give themselves 9999 JP and go hog wild. 
I mean, it's it's <clears throat> I mean it's a forerunner of some very tight games like the Disgaea games are very tight games that all the moving parts work together very well, but FF Tactics doesn't have that at all. Yeah, and it it seems very. It's got a combination of really small locations in comparison to stuff that I'm used to, like a 2D strategy game like Fire Emblem, or a a, a next uh, the following generations strategy game like Disgaea or something else that uh, Nipponichi has made. So like, it it's that really awkward point where they were really trying to make like an an interesting tactical thing based kind of off the rules of, like, d- tabletop stuff, but also all the maps are, like, 8x8. Eight eight. Like, they're really small maps, except for some yeah. of them, which are enormous and, like, triple the size of everything else, and they're a pain in the ass to traverse, because you have, like, four move tops normally. But, yeah, it's, yeah. This isn't gonna, I like, I want to say this is my nice thing I'm saying about it, but it doesn't even sound nice, but... Tactics is like it's like a weird PC game where the only people who play tested are like the devs. They play and they had their own specific like standards and they're already really good at the systems and they were gaming their own systems and they're like that's cool let's keep gaming the system. And then it, it's just really evocative and how weird and like frayed this the the system is. It doesn't it doesn't connect and you're just like you're just like you have to go in deep into it. And then you're like it's like it's like suffocating basically. But it's like it's pretty interesting that. Your the game has like its own internal logic that doesn't apply to any, to any other video game. To well, it has its own internal logic, but its own internal logic is actually contradictory. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, parts of it work against each other. It's it's not like it's not coherent. Oh, I just I just mean it has like a particular rules a particular rule set that you yeah. won't find anywhere else. <laughs> and it's it's interesting to get to know it, but it's also kind of ugly. Yeah, um, I've actually seen real human beings go like yeah i'm gonna make this extra challenging hack of final fantasy tactics and other human beings that are just like yeah i'm gonna grind the shit out of it so i have an arithmetician and just (laughs) win and people somehow derive joy out of both halves of this equation which is something i genuinely do not understand um but i mean whatever fucking floats your boat uh, Don't whatever, kick shame. Whatever casts float <laughs> on your boat. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yours was better. I'm sorry. I stepped on your punchline and yours was better. Um, it's fine. So then we. From that, we moved on to two pretty good games. Yeah. In Grandia 2 and Breath of Fire 2, which each for their period were just kind of pretty competent, polished, self aware video game stories, I felt. Um, I mean, I, I think we all enjoyed them quite a lot. I, I know. No. You, no. You got a bit sick of Grandia I'm 2 not by gonna, the end. I know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do any. Like I'll just say, like Grandia 2 is barely above Xenogears for me, and that, well, that's pretty much where I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> yeah, like I, I was fine with Grandia 2 up until like, well, the second half. Like, I guess it was the second half. Everything after like Ryudo kills Melfus. I was just like, eh. and I've had time to ruminate on that, and it's just kind of like, well, it, it sure did its thing, and like the aesthetic of like Dreamcast ass colors and body horror is interesting, and <laughs> that's that's it, a word for it, yeah. And I need the aesthetic was interesting in that game well for for grandia 2 being like i call it straightforward it also has a ton of stuff going on it's it's like it's very yeah competent is a good word for it yeah it's it's mm. competent but also just like it just kind of left left a bad taste in my mouth after a while and that has only gotten kind of worse with time to think about how it left me but like also it's a decent game. I'm not gonna like warn ev- anyone off from playing it. Just like it's twenty bucks on Steam. It'll last you thirty hours. It's not a terrible game. It's just kind of not my thing. Well, I liked it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's Breath like, of Fire like, Two. It's like the reverse Trails in the Sky, basically. Basically, I guess. It, yeah, kind of. Um, we wouldn't. It, there'd be no point doing this if we all agreed on everything. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. And I, yeah, I think like on the podcast, 
I can't really get, I can't like get emotional about it. I don't even like remember my points that well, but I, I, I know I summed it up fairly well that I just, Rito's change just kind of like, just, it was just kind of like a betrayal of what I was invested in the game. And I just didn't get anything out of it after that. Yeah. Fair enough. And Leroy's points on the podcast and just general disposition to the second half of the game made me realize how much I kind of didn't like it. And also just like, as much as I do like just destroying everything with magic and all attack techs, like the second half of the game kind of devolved into like, yeah, you have all these choices, but you're going to use the same ones over and over again because they're good choices. And <laughs> it just kind of like lost any interesting moments for me. So, eh. After Grandia 2, we played Breath of Fire 2, which was, we forced Leroy to pick a game, and that was last month, and, uh... I think, I think, I think, uh, Becky just called them both, uh, like, competent games in their era. Like, I can just call them blue-collar games, right? They're, they show up and they do their job. <laughs> they're they're That's... not, like, they're not incredibly ambitious, but, like, they're, they're definitely gonna get the job done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Breath of Fire definitely had some flight of ambition. Some of the, um... Like the the dragon's eye at the start. Is, it had it had a, a, it, it had a moment. vision, right? But I don't know if it. I, I don't know if I call it ambitious necessarily. But no, not a lot of Super Nintendo games. I don't really feel are that ambitious. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been I've been playing probably the most uh, quote unquote ambitious game on the SNES <laughs> recently on stream, and ambition does not play well with SNES level writing and gameplay and just quality. Uh, I think I think there is there is there's like um after after a lot of you know they all the devs lived through Nintendo and Master System and they they learned a lot at that point and they knew how to make you know games that could sell and so there's a lot of that like niceness on Super Nintendo so people really like Super Nintendo but like the games you play on Super Nintendo are kind of like the same stuff you play now <laughs> it just doesn't interest me as much yeah um. But yeah, Breath of Fire 2 was... It's one of those games that people tend to talk about. is like, not Final Fantasy games on the SNES. And it turned out to be actually pretty good. Once you got used to the, uh... Kind of the Dragon Quest level grind that could happen at times. But, like, with the pacing of the encounters, you're usually getting enough experience to not hit any major roadblocks and dungeons. And if you were, you usually knew before you got too deep in the dungeon, so you could go elsewhere and grind. Yeah. And also, like, the aesthetic of everyone is weird non-humans in your party is pretty good. Becky called it the Banjo-Kazooie at one point, and that was okay. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. I mean, that that did evoke that to me. So that was year one. That was year one. I think we can basically... Well, I have a couple questions we could ask. Uh, What has been everyone's favourite episode? Favourite episode? Like, I really enjoyed doing the Residents of Fate episode, but I think I got a lot more out of that than, than everyone else. That's why I'm asking you your favourite episode, not <laughs> everyone else. You dweeb. Well, no, I mean, like... To say that I had particular reasons for liking that episode, you know, and, and feeling that it was valuable. Yeah, Thousand Year Door, I think, was like the the discussion we were able to create in that one, and also in Breath of Fire Two. Um, I think we did really good work in those episodes. Yeah, I, I think those were interesting episodes because we used we were still kind of able to draw forth interesting discussions from kind of genre staple games that a lot of people probably wouldn't have like taken a second look at. But we managed to spin some pre- pretty interesting talk out of it. How about you, Leroy? I like the Xenogears episode because we're all on point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I'm i tempted to agree with you, but I'm probably going to say, like, hmm. I'm, I'm also, I'm partial to the, I'm partial to the Residence of Fate episode, and but I also, I actually like the Trails in the Sky episode because it was, it was an interesting back and forth of, like, like, uh, two different like approaches or ideologies different when it came to that game and like what me and Becky got out of it were way different, but we like came to an understanding. Yeah, and I just shut yeah. up and let you two talk <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise I'd have been sulking the entire fucking episode. That when I introduced a game to the podcast, no one likes it. <laughs> <laughs> that 
that's a good voice. <laughs> well, we have finally broken the duck on that one. Yeah, fucking finally, but we're not on to this topic yet. Um, My yeah. favorite episode was probably just Final Fantasy Tactics because Pete was on it and Pete's cool. And uh, we didn't mention them when we were talking about Final Fantasy Tactics. But um, yeah, shout out, shout outs to Pete. Uh, Pete has also, uh, I commissioned them for the bumpers to this episode and future episodes. Uh, we are now a real podcast and we have our own like intro and outro music and uh, I like it. Um, Officially also, a real podcast. It's like, yes. this is our debut. Yes. And we <laughs> have a logo in. and <laughs> I made a really indulgent logo and it has a slime. But yeah, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics was interesting because I think... Tactics is one of those games that, like, a lot, a lot of people kind of hold up as, like, oh, this is the lost, the lost days of the good Final Fantasies. And having someone who was a fan of it at that time was an interesting, uh, twist. But I would also say Kingdom Hearts worked for having interesting people on for the podcast because Jackson also was fresh to the, to the game. Yeah. Um, the, the tactics episode is like as good as the senior years episode. It's kind of the same thing, where we're like, "All right, we're gonna dispel all the myths, you guys." <laughs> and also, we changed <laughs> these games. Stuff. Yeah. <sighs> well, it sounded like Pete, like while they were playing it, uh, they they yeah. kind of like came to new conclusions too. But yeah. But yeah, the, I fully condone revisiting things you really love with a critical and adult eye, because if you were like ten when you played it, you probably could probably get something new out of it if you come back with a fresh a fresh look. Um, which game surprised you the most out of the ones we've played for the podcast? Xeno Gears. How bad it was. <laughs> sad, I, sad to say, but it I was. was. I like, was thinking about... Yeah, Becky's right. I was thinking about good games, but Xeno Gears was the most surprising. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, before we played Xeno Gears, I watched a full LP of Xeno Saga, all three games. And the Xeno Saga is clearly a lot better than Xeno Gears. It's very inconsistent because there's so much of it, but it's like average at, averages out way better than Xeno Gears. And I was really hopeful and really interested in Xeno Gears. And Xeno Gears is nothing but Xeno Saga being its descendant promised. Yeah, I think people often like go, "Oh, Xeno like games get like more diluted as they get." like, iterated upon, but, like, Xeno Gears had nothing. And that was yeah. what was most mm, shocking well, for me. Con- like, like, nothing converse, is... Worked. Conversely, it had too much. <laughs> yeah, it had too much, but not enough. <laughs> um, and, the other, like, going going the other direction, to be positive, I think Breath of Fire 2, because I was, like, Leroy likes difficult games, and old games that <laughs> to me are kind of impenetrable <laughs> and suggested this one that is an old game with a bit of a reputation for kind of grindiness or difficulty and I was expecting it to be horrible and actually it turned out that I completely misinterpreted what Leroy meant by hard old games that are difficult <laughs> um, so yeah that that was the, the more pleasant surprise I guess I, there, when it comes to games like those like you definitely need to be pretty familiar with the style of games. It's I think it's like that with other forms of art too. Like once you understand like the more accessible, easily understood stuff, you can without difficulty probably jump into stuff that's a bit harder, more impenetrable to, you know. Yeah, and so, like with JRPGs especially, one of our questions will discuss this, but like once you get kind of experience with adjacent styles of JRPG, you can probably address some of the more obscure ones with some similar knowledge and not have too hard of a time. But also, Breath of Fire 2 is just kind of really approachable without handles things. And uh, I would also definitely recommend the retranslation. Just please, please don't, <laughs> please love yourself. Uh, um, yeah. I got it. I have a fascination with broken English. It's like, <laughs> it's like... It's like poetry, but bad poetry. <laughs> it's I, like I suppose, like I see where you're coming from, and I it's like, like computer that in generated like, song poetry. lyrics where it lasts five minutes and you don't have to solve any puzzles. <laughs> but I cannot imagine playing Breath of Fire two in the original translation because it's just impenetrable. 
Yeah, uh, like that, uh, like the witch asking you if you want an explanation, and if you say yes, she just tells you how to do it, and if you say no, then she lets you actually fuse things. So, oh yeah, I think I think on my I think for my positive surprise, it was it was probably Trolls in the Sky because as I played through about half of it, I was actually already burned out on it. I just didn't think it was. I just think it had it was just like building up to nothing, you know, I was just doing nothing. But it it its second half is pretty good and it turns around all the development it's doing. Mm-hmm. My negative surprise was probably Resonance of Fate. Like I just mm, mm, I I really wish that game had more there and it wasn't such like a a fever dream in motion. Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say you're wrong, but I'm just. I just want to make a joke at Xenogears. Like, for even for games I took personally, like Grandia Two, I personally didn't like. Like, I'm still putting Xenogears. I'm just shoving that down there because yeah. I didn't even have a personal reaction to Xenogears. I don't even like care about it that much either way. It's just, <laughs> I, it doesn't. It doesn't need to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's just, talking about Xenogears again. <laughs> that's not. Um, but yeah, Resonance of Fate was kind of like, oh, a lot of people like this game, and it has, like, a characters. It has characters! Oh my god! And no, nothing. It has a character, maybe. Resonance of Fate is like, it's like the it's like the inverse of a morality play. It has, like, these stereotypes, but they're all evil. <laughs> <laughs> also, Daddy morality does not play. approve. Stop that. <laughs> Nolan North telling you... Daddy does not approve! <laughs> Currently, <laughs> Nolan North uh, voicing Vashon was the worst thing. It was the best. Thing. I'm that? so glad I played it with the Japanese audio. <sighs> Just imagine Nathan Drake being the worst, and then imagine <laughs> him playing was the and worst. even worse. <laughs> oh my god! Anyway, that was actually good typecasting, in my opinion. Like bad, but good. They they knew he was a Nathan Drake. <laughs> Um, okay, so have you learned anything from either working on games for the podcast or related projects in the last year? Um, the, that's open to, like, Becky's uh, personal diary or travel notes or Leroy's work on indie game crit, which is really good. You, you guys should check out. Um, open question. <laughs> well, I... Th- um, I th- well, sorry, I just, go ahead. I'll go f- fast and first the fundamental breakthrough i wrote this i don't remember maybe it was after wild arms but it was pretty early into doing the podcast but i kind of boiled down a a really understandable definition of the jrpg without there being like any quibbling or contradictions or focusing too much on style over content or anything like that Uh, (laughs) it's just like like for a workable definition you know you got to consider japanese games japanese and that came from the, that did come from the podcast because um, thinking about like what exactly makes up a JRPG and it's 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 not really it's not really like that's like going in the wrong order you 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 need to look at what the JRPG is doing and then say that's a JRPG and not what do JRPGs do and then apply that to a JRPG because you're not going to get any uh, success. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that because what we're basically talking about there is, is whether there is like an essence of a JRPG that exists independently of the kind of national cultural context of Japan, which of course there isn't. And I think for me too, I, I, what I would say is I've maybe I kind of felt this earlier, but doing the podcast and doing all this work on, on so many different games. Um, and I've played like 20, 25 different JRPGs in the year. Like now I can articulate that better. And like Leroy, you wrote, your piece, I wrote the fish list, which is totally not about important fish in JRPGs, by the way. Please read it to the end. The last five paragraphs are quite important about how this, like, even kind of talking about this as a genre isn't quite the right approach. Like, it's a bunch of stuff that piles in through this one particular spatial context and, and economic context and, and moments in time as well. Like, you can look at this more as a history than as a, a, a genre or an aesthetic category. I think that's what I've become able to to articulate better. And she said, struggling to articulate the point, <laughs> but then mind. And I, I think that's a, that's a good answer to another question we have from Samuel Howitt, 
who asks, Out of all the JRPGs you have played, do you get a sense of strong commonalities between them, or is it more of a loose collective of games coming from the same nation? The latter. <laughs> well, it's... Well, it's no, a, it's, like, it's a bit of There both. are strong commonalities, yeah. but they are... But there are multiple different ones that are kind of sometimes tangled up a bit. Like, Jeez. it's <clears throat> four different histories that all mingle and because of the the trans-Pacific distance, kind of blur together for English writing. And part of what we got to do is, is separate out those different threads. Um, you can you can obviously trace the influences, like... Uh, a, a thing I always attribute to Dragon Quest, because it is Dragon Quest, is when you're playing Crown Sugar, for example, and the plot is a bunch of short stories. It's not, you know, it's not just one focused thing that you're laser-focused on doing. You know, you just kind of tumble around and solve problems, and that has been... Like that's just that's what Dragon Quest did in the very beginning, and so when you when you feel that trope, when you feel that in a JRPG, you know it's coming from a very long lineage of very old JRPGs, and they're just like that's why it has this episodic stru- uh, structure going on. And well, I, d- I do want to say like they have commonalities. I'm not saying they're they're not, but when I say like when I say um, I don't know what Sam was, if, if this is precisely what Sam thinks, but like are they a loose co- collective with some commonalities? Yes, they're not exactly yeah. like there is no hard lineage, hard, except for like series, and even then it's kind of loose. And yeah, actually, one one thing going back to the question about what we've learned, one thing I have learned or realized this year is is that there is no such thing as a Final Fantasy game either. <laughs> yeah, like the the Final Fantasy is not a series; it's a brand. It's a franchise. And I I I the, very particular. About series versus franchise, series is just like this is all one like series. These are consequent entries, or like in Suikoden's case, they jump around, but like they're all in the same line. And the franchise is just like here's an idea, and here's things spinning off from that. Yeah, but I mean, by that definition, Tales is a franchise, but yeah. Final Fantasy isn't even that. Final Fantasy is a brand, which is something even less cohesive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's true. All, all you can really like, there's fire spells. Their, their third tier is the end. It, <laughs> it ends in gah. Well, that, that's the thing. Like the, the things that tie the Final Fantasy games together, apart from title, are either superficial things like it's got chocobos and moogles in it, or are industrial things like the people who made it and the, the funding structure that exists to, to support that. Mm-hmm. And like it's important to understand that funding structure because the more you look at it, the more the more you realize how much people working under that brand now are reacting to what was going on twenty years ago and ten years ago. But trying to look at it as there's this artistic thing that is Final Fantasy, when you compare that to a franchise like Tales, where there clearly is an artistic thing that is Tales, it's it's a very you, you realize that's a futile effort. Really. Yeah, it, it's a really disparate brand. Like I, I also hesitate to like call it a series. It, and like I, I've joked about this, but also, Final Fantasy fifteen is gonna come out, and people are, if they were just going off of, like what they would say they go off of, an open world ish game with action combat is gonna be a final is gonna make Final Fantasy fifteen a Western RPG, but it's not. It's Japanese. Yeah, and they won't and call pe- it. People are. People are genuinely going to write FF15 is not an FF game think pieces because they do that for every FF game. Yep. Um like but only like 2 weeks after it's come out and they're like and they like it's not an FF game because it's good and then like 9 months down the line <laughs> or it's uh, bad. Yeah, like they'll No, it will be as soon as they get stuck on their first boss that they can't kill with the strat they learned playing FF7. <laughs> um Press attack. It's like this isn't this isn't an FF7, This isn't a Final Fantasy game. It's like fucking bullshit. Kingdom Hearts meets Assassin's Creed. And, um. <laughs> um. To come back to Sam's question real quick, for like for like the reverse example, uh, this is more obscure, but like um, when surrealism was like not a general adjective you use, but it was like a literal style of painting. Um, there were leaders. There were leaders in this movement. 
and they had a manifesto and they talked to each other and they told each other what is and what's not surrealism. And then when you have that going on, um, that's when it's like a unified art form when it has that ridiculous structure and effort to um, define what is and what isn't. But with video games, it's only it's only fans who do that kind of policing. But the, the developers, they they're not they they don't like have a hierarchy there's not a secret jrpg society where they decide what is and what isn't a jrpg so that's why it like doesn't really work yeah although it's worth it's worth stressing on that point that we really don't know what japanese people write about ja- about jrpgs like we don't know what the japanese equivalent of dead genre chronicles is because it's only a very limited segment of japanese media about video games that gets translated and none of us are fluent japanese readers yeah like there's no way that like we could come across we we could definitely come across like a games criticism blog from japan or like a podcast from japan about rpgs uh either from japan or elsewhere but like that's not going to get translated because that's not like an official thing like that's just fans being fans like people mm. would have to learn english to listen to this podcast it's not going to get like a translation so it's kind of hard to judge criticism across borders when you don't know the language of the nation you want to uh, listen to the criticism of yeah and it is really easy because of that language barrier and this is like the underlying problem of all English writing about Japanese games, it's really easy to assume that the weird little projects that very few people pay attention to, the equivalent of hours or like critical distance or whatever, don't happen in Japan because we only see the stuff that gets translated. But, and we're encouraged to take a very homogeneous view of, of foreign cultures, but there are definitely people doing this kind of work in Japan. I put any amount of money you want on it. But yeah. we don't know who they are. And we won't know what they're saying, because there's no industry for that. And, like, like I don't even know how that would become available to English-speaking folks, just because, like, the best you could hope for is to find, like, a translation service and, like, commission them to translate this stuff. And that would be a lot of effort. And Yeah. I don't well, know. I mean, the best yeah. bet is for us to learn Japanese, but that takes a yeah, while. But, like, but also, like, I mean, making it available... For other people who don't. Yeah, yeah. Like, you would have to literally translate that, and, like, with fucking blogs, you could at least hit Google Translate and get, like, a really shitty version of what's going on, but uh, for so, audio, so you, I, yeah. Zoyander has translated um, criticism from Japan, like, highlights that they found from the internet. Yeah, there, there's a few bits, and, and like... We should actually give some some major props to to Zoya Street for that work because it's they, there's some really fantastic stuff that they've done, but it's it's very small relative to the, the amount of stuff there must be out there. But yeah, uh, I mean, the frustrating gap besides, or more frustrating to me besides like not knowing because it's an unknown. I guess there's nothing I can really do about it. It's that most people fill the up the unknown with a Western narrative of how we receive the games as being how the games are received fundamentally. And there's not yeah. like, there's not a cultural, well, a global cl- awareness going on when people make their, <laughs> their hot takes. Good. That's, and that's, so that's, a, that's a lot more frustrating. Um, so for my final question, we still have one more after this from someone, uh, a listener. Uh, but for my final question, I'd like to ask, what are you looking forward to in continuing the podcast? Um, you mean like specific games or just anything? Whatever you'd like. I don't know, I, I enjoy doing it and I want to keep doing it, basically. You know, there are definitely some games that are coming up and I don't want to spoil things. There are definitely some games coming up that I'm very interested in or invested in. That might be a recipe for disaster, but we'll see. So it's so not to say the same thing, because it's true for me too, but um, the podcast has been like, I guess it's really personal too, kind of, but like, whatever. It's a really great practice for me, um like articulating and talking about these things like critical things and hard ideas that I'm I'm not necessarily a great public speaker either um so I've you know gotten more confident at my own ideas and being heard and sharing my own opinions and the podcast has been a great outlet for that and I could you know I could see myself like maybe in the future being able to do a talk or something because of you know 
it's just starting on this podcast. So that's been it's been pretty good. That's good. Mm. Yeah. Honestly, like we started this on like a super whim and it it's gotten support and I appreciate that support a lot. Um I'm really just looking forward to having more excuses to talk to these two nerds about <laughs> games that we may or may not like. Um <laughs> And I hope we get enough Patreon support to justify doing a Pokemon episode, because I think that's going to be, like, a weird thing. But also, um, like, I'm really just looking forward to playing some more interesting games and talking about them and looking at their critical context for a year or two or five more. If we get, yep. up, to, if we get up to five more years of this, we will have an episode 69 <laughs> and that will be nice. Um, <laughs> oh god! On that, on that Pokemon episode, I don't think anyone really knows like how much of a Pokemon nerd I am. I keep it contained. Um, I used to be. I used to have a, a forum signature where I listed all the Pokemon I had bred. So it's fine. Ye so, gods. So Max, Max has been playing Fire Red lately, and whenever it comes up, I just start talking about all the Pokemon games for no reason. I'm just like, why am I doing this? <laughs> Leroy is a secret nerd, uh, not so secret nerd. Okay, our, our last question about the Euro podcasting we've done so far comes from our our friend Pete, Fuzzy Proxy. A lot of DGC has been varied in terms of JRPG type, age, and construction. Have certain games shown themselves to be exemplary titles from specific eras? And are some titles a lot less timeless than the base, Discord, base discourse would claim them to be? Well, like, mm, oh Resident's Fate is absolutely exemplary of its era. 100%. <laughs> I, I was actually going to say that. That game could, could not have existed at any other time and perfectly expresses what it was like to be a, a vid game at that time. I think, I think, um, I think, I think when it comes to, it also comes to this, actually, this question is actually asking, how do you interpret history? And I'm, like, I think, like, history is just set in the moment it comes out. So most of these games basically could only come out when they came out. They're products of their like it's just how history works it's product of its time i um, guess i mean like i, I, so the, I, I, the I know i know becomes, i know the question they, is that what, supposed to be so strict right yeah well it, the question becomes what do they reveal about their about their time and which ones are, are really useful as examples of their time that's true um, too because like i also feel like like xenogears could only come out when it came out but it's also like it's like this tarnished mark it's like the most <laughs> ridiculous excesses of the playstation era and just like like that experimentation of like we're gonna try to tell serious stories now we're gonna like do serious art and it's just masato kato's fan fiction <laughs> they can't veto it they don't really know <laughs> yeah i mean there, there are counter examples to that though because like thousand year door i think partly because it's a nintendo game on a nintendo console and seems to have as its identity and its presence very much Nintendo first, JRPG second. Feels a lot more timeless to me. That's true. Or at least not um, if at least not timeless, like outside of video game time. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and I it's, think it's a critical elf whenever everything else is humans. It's just very <laughs> long lived. Yeah. And apart from apart from like the colour scheme, I think Grandia two a little bit as well. Like no, I, 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 a, with, when I when I think around it too, I just focus on the aesthetics. And I'm just like, no, that could only come out when it came out. <laughs> well, it could it could only look like that on the Dreamcast, right? Well, even when you when you return to that kind of style, like I am Satsuna returns to low poly 3D, but it's like it's very sharp and um, very very clear. It's not muddy, not blurry. So like. It's like specifically Grandia Two's look will never probably never happen again, unless you just yeah, literally want to emulate probably for the best. that. Which I don't know why yeah. you want to emulate that. <laughs> if you wanted to make it a, like if if you had a, a a really cliche idea about what being on drugs is like, and you wanted to make a game about being on drugs, that is when you would go for the Grandia Two aesthetic, <laughs> complete with body um, horror. <laughs> yep. Just honestly, there's there's better there's better lo-fi 3D now. Like you can just kind of blur the screen a bit, and now you're you're good. You don't even need to make it like everything smeared and conflicting and contrasting. That's also probably because the PC port just upped the resolution on some things, not others, though. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think Xeno Gears is like people talk like that game is like some epic masterpiece, but like it's really just like a bad PS1 game. <laughs> And it's a lot of it's a lot of pointers to masterpiece. Like it, the surface of the game keeps going. Look at this; it's so deep, but it's actually it's not deep; it's hollow. 
it's it's uh, it's it's an extremely unique PlayStation game, and not just in its <laughs> badness too. It's just like, just, I mean, yeah. Well, but, I mean, part but, of it because it's unapologetic, but it also just does weird as fuck things. But that's also disc to his fault. But still, <laughs> yeah. Like I I think like exemplary. Yeah, it's very exemplary of like the aspirations of PlayStation One games, but it's also super dated. And, like, even though I like Kingdom Hearts 2, it is also kind of exemplary of what they were trying to do. Not they, but, like, what game designers were trying to mimic with um, action games in that era. Japanese games specifically, because, like, DMC existed. God of War sure exists, and it doesn't feel good, but... um. I don't like God of War, but people love that game and pointed it as a character action game. And <laughs> then I cry. Um, yeah, I, I think Becky was right. Like, Paper Mario is really surprisingly long-lived. A Thousand Year Door, anyway, still looks good. I yeah. don't think Paper Mario 1 looks good. Um, no, Paper Mario 1 is, is, is... And also, it's a slog. It's kind of a slog. <laughs> it's a slog. Paper Mario 1 is my favorite. <laughs> It yeah, would be. You, I also you, I also like Sticker Star. I'm just like over here like I like these games they're weird. I mean that's more consistent than some people we know. So, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I I just think games are interesting and I don't know the think, time timelessness is like a I, thing we should worry about. Too well, much, there's 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 a leaping off point I've just been thinking about like literally just now. Cuz Trails came out when did it originally come out like 2000 Three, Four. 2004. 2000 it came out originally two thousand four, but then it, the the remakes were two thousand ten or something. I don't even know. Eleven. <laughs> so, so I was wondering off both times, but you know people received that very well, and even Kotaku received it as if it was just released in two thousand eleven, even, even though it wasn't. And so, as these styles become better understood and more democratized, like anyone can make a RPG and it'll be accepted as that. Like it's gonna be. Like feeling distinct. Oh, this could only come out during 1994. That that's gonna just happen less and less because people are gonna be drawing from all the different eras of games, and they're gonna like pick with what aesthetics appeal to them. And then, like, it, it's 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 gonna be like music, basically, where you you're at least, especially since you know, music on the internet, where there's not like time periods and scenes. There's just kind of chaos, and people do what they like. Yeah, I. I... I think that's probably true. I, I I was gonna bring up the fact that Trails in the Sky did like get a seven year gap, uh, and then it re released and people it re released with a better translation and people still liked it a decade after it originally came out. So like it's uh, we're past the point where like presentation is like super dated. So stuff's probably gonna get a generally more. It's it's still the it's it's still the minority, but people are coming around to that. Possibly the most high definition, most realistic graphics aren't always the most appropriate aesthetic yeah. for a video game. God. <laughs> yeah. We can hope so. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that we're we're kind of past. Well, I think PlayStation One and like early PS Two is like that the most awkward period for graphics and like the most dated looks. But people are still going back to that, like, aesthetic. So I think we're just going to get a giant blending pot full of, like, aesthetics detached from their time periods and design that has either borrowed from or learned from uh, older generations and just kind of move forward with all those lessons in tow. So Yeah, the pessimistic take on that is that that's how we get to Tokyo RPG Factory. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn! I, like, the, <laughs> like the deep pessimistic thing is also how like there's no history anymore. I know that's a theory which I don't really understand because I haven't read that deep into it. But everything's historical yeah. now. There's the super pessimistic view is that that's what led to Neptunia. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I what led to Neptunia was just horny. It was just horniness. <laughs> horny nerds. There's there's no there's no I secret fuck there. My GameCube. <laughs> yeah. Face, yeah. <laughs> Damn it, Colleen! <laughs> oh no, Colleen is actually responsible for Neptunia! No! I mean, for the record, it's you who accidentally blamed Colleen for Neptunia, not me. I'm sorry, Colleen. 
I mean, what's actually res- responsible for Neptune is people wanting to fuck their PlayStations. Um, and those people have no taste, so no, it's fine. No, fucking Noir isn't the fan favorite. People, like, they want to fuck the Neptune, a, a isn't, console isn't that Nept- does not Sega? exist. Or it's, or it's fan yeah, fiction. It, oh, it's the Sega console that didn't come out. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's uh. still not the GameCube, though. <laughs> And the GameCube is not actually present because it's Gen 7 consoles. So, <laughs> everyone wants to fuck the Wii. <laughs> That's a sentence that you never want to have to say. <laughs> Let's okay, move on. Let's move on. Um, you know, it's we, been an hour should, and a half. And we should, play a Nip- talk- we no. should play a Neptunia game. I will fucking fight you. In real life, <laughs> I will just... Show up and slap you. Where are you playing Conception? <laughs> yeah, but that's different. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather play a Conception game for the podcast than a Neptunia game. <sighs> yeah, actually, I don't really want to play a Neptunia game at all. It was just funny. I, I want to play the first one up to the Forest Whale, and then I'll be done. <laughs> <laughs>